Before we get started, who all is planning on doing graduation this year? Graduating? Any of you? No? Any of you planning on going to the biology graduation? Should be a lot of fun even if you're not actually graduating. Uh, I will be your MC, which might or might not scare you away, <laughs> depends on your point of view. There will be no quizzes, I promise. So let's see, that was the main announcement I think that I had. Oh, second one is that we'll have a guest lecturer on Wednesday. Uh, Dr. Alec Hirsch from OHSU will talk about flaviviruses. He's one of the leading flavivirus researchers, particularly about West Nile, a lot of work they've done, and some work on dengue fever as well, um, and yellow fever, because that's sort of the, the classic of these different viruses. So um, those are, <clears throat> as we'll see, kind of like the virus that we'll talk about today, only with uh, envelope around the outside, but otherwise very, very similar. A couple other things that I need to remedy first. Uh, we talked about Lambda a couple times ago. Anyone tried to find the DVE yet? Yes, it's there? Mm -hmm. Good. Okay, and it worked? Yeah, you can check out our last talk that has the DVE there. It's about the number we got for that. Okay, cool. Yeah, as I said, it worked on mine for my hand, so I made it back. Uh, the main thing I wanted to mention was that. Esther Lederberg was really the person who was the one who made that identification of the induced prophage in Lambda at the time. And there's actually quite a nice write-up in Time, I think, last week um, on Esther Lederberg and um, all the work that she did. And her husband ended up getting the Nobel Prize. Whether he got the Nobel Prize for work that she did is a little unclear. Uh, but Definitely credit where credit is due um, on this one. So, <clears throat> um, second one is not so much my mistake, uh, no, not so much my mistake on emission, but actually my mistake completely in talking about <clears throat> the actions of some of the enzymes in these plant viruses, particularly. Cucumber mosaic virus. Uh, I mentioned, I think, in my lecture, I didn't go back and check, that this MT here was actually a movement protein. That is wrong, incorrect, mea maxima culpa, and I wanted to correct that. This is a methyl transferase, and I completely forgot about mentioning this, and I really should have because it also will bear on today's lecture as well. I mentioned that these guys have each of the genome segments in cucumber mosaic virus, has a five prime cap. But these five prime caps are not RNAs that are in the cytoplasm. Where's the capping machinery, usually? In the nucleus, exactly. And are these things getting to the nucleus? Not that we talked about, and no, they don't. So where does that cap come from? That cap comes from the methyltransferase, which is encoded in the virus genome. So it's actually methylating the RNA, which is being made by the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, or the replicase. So that's an important point, and that's something that we'll be talking about actually for all of the RNA viruses that we're going to talk about this term, and there are quite a few more that we're going to go through. What do you have at the five prime end? What do you have at the three prime end? The last time we talked quite a bit about what's happening at the three prime end of these viruses, they've all got these tRNA-like structures, which are important for protecting the three prime end of their genomes. So is that a little clearer? And that actually also means that this table, which talks about the methyl transferase domain um, and five prime capping of viral RNAs, is correct, and I was incorrect. So, mea maxima culpa on that one. I should go back and just delete that part of the lecture from last time. But that would not be completely fair. Um, so, if there were to be a question on this on a future midterm, um, the MT protein is the methyl transferase, which is important for making the cap structures. So, and we'll, again, we'll talk more about caps later on as we go on through the <clears throat> rest of the course and talk about some more of these RNA viruses. So today, I wanted to talk about the pico RNA viruses. Many of you may have heard these called picorna viruses. Um, I don't like that terminology at all because I think it's confusing. 
because they're small RNA viruses. Um, but most of the people who call them picornaviruses are people who work in the field and who are people who are literally working on picoRNA viruses. But I find it a lot easier to think about that. But so if you ever hear someone say picornavirus, it's really a picoRNA virus. Um, they're just two different ways of pronouncing the same thing. So instead of talking about origins, um, we're actually going to talk about disease um, toward the end of today's lecture. So kind of flipped up our regular order. Um, first, a little bit about structure. And we've talked quite a bit about structures of some of these picoRNA viruses, particularly the really well-studied one, which is polio. Also, how polio binding and entry happens. Um, binding and entry of polio virus, curiously enough, is a lot like what happens with a lot of bacteriophage. There's a big conformational change. The virion stays outside the cell. And there's kind of a pore made in the membrane. And the genome goes through that. So again, quite different than most of the other eukaryotic viruses. Uh, the genome itself, these are picoRNA viruses. So they're RNA viruses. They're positive strand RNA genomes. And one of the really fascinating aspects about these genomes is they're made up of a polyprotein. So one ginormous open reading frame, one big protein is made, and then it gets chopped up into smaller pieces by viral proteases. And this is a theme that we'll hear in the next couple of lectures quite a bit. Polyproteins and then cleavage by viral, and then, as we'll hear later, also some cellular proteases that are involved in chopping this one big protein into a bunch of smaller proteins. Um, replication for these guys, basically the same kind of problem that we've talked about with RNA viruses before. You've got to deal with 5 prime to 3 prime positive strand, your negative strand going back in the opposite direction, running into the translation machinery. You need to make more of positive strand than you need to make of negative strand. So there's going to be this balance between replication and translation. How these guys get out um, is actually a bit of an open question. And there's some interesting new data that we might not have a chance to talk about in terms of how some of these picoRNA viruses are released. And then we'll talk a little bit about disease and then the hopeful eradication of polio. We're getting pretty darn close to eradicating polio. There's some issues with that as well, and we'll, we'll talk about some of those towards the end. A lot of them actually political, <laughs> having very little to do with the virology, which I didn't want to get too much into in this class. <clears throat> so the picoRNA viruses, uh, here is the table from our textbook, um, has various different genera. I would say don't remember all of them. And then you know, four additional picoRNA viruses that aren't listed here, um, probably way, 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 way more. Um, as soon as you start to look at environmental samples, you find lots and lots of picoRNA virus sequences. And so this is a definitely very short list of those that are, in fact, known. But a couple of things I wanted to point out. First one, poliovirus. This is the one what most of the work has been done on, mostly because it can cause some neural diseases, but one of the things you may notice here, enteroviruses. Enteroviruses means what? They're mostly present in the gut. And so that poliovirus ends up causing neurologic disease is really kind of a dead end as far as polio is concerned. And a lot of researchers are interested in how that's actually happening. Um, rhinoviruses, I may actually have a rhinovirus right now, slightly runny nose, rhino being your nose, uh, common cold. The vast majority of common cold viruses are these picoRNA viruses. Um, and a lot of this um, is pretty well known, but they're incredibly diverse, which means that finding antivirals for cold is very challenging to do. And then just the last one I wanted to mention down here, hepatitis A virus. We'll talk about lots of different hepatitis viruses. And this is one of the problems that virology has had in terms of nomenclature for many, many years. There are lots of different viruses which can cause hepatitis, and they're completely different molecularly from one to another. Um, we'll talk about hepatitis C, or I should say, um, Dr. Hirsch will talk about hepatitis C a little bit on Wednesday. Um, we don't have a chance to talk about hepatitis B, but that's a completely different kind of virus. All of them cause liver disease, um, but they're really all very different relative to each other. So that's just sort of the overview. What do these guys look like? Um, T equals three with a twist. 
in that twist is that they're pseudo g equals 3. All that pseudo means is that you're using different proteins now. Instead of one protein repeated 180 times, you have three proteins which are repeated 60 times each. And that's shown just by the different colors here. So blue, red, and green are VP1, VP2, and VP3. You've got 60 of each of these. And then on the inside, there's a VP4. And one of the things that's a little hard to see here, I was actually looking for my 3D printed versions of these. And um, see, we can look really briefly right here. This is my 3D printing software, where I'm just about to print out a few more of these versions of poliovirus. See if we can do the whole thing here. No, somehow it's gotten over-zoomed. Um, but <clears throat> what we have here is, again, pretty classic t equals 3 symmetry, how all of these things are put together. But <clears throat> at the same time, we have some bumps on the outside. And so the, the bump here, these are where all of these individual subunits are put together. You've got a five-fold axis here, five-fold axis here. Here's your three-fold axis. Maybe a little hard to see here, but these sort of dark blue here, this is the sort of what they call the canyon around the five-fold axis of symmetry. And it's this piece right here which actually binds to the virus receptor, which is kind of funky. You usually think about things that are projecting from the virion surface as being where they interact with the receptor. Here, the receptor binding is actually kind of between the capsid subunits. Um, so it's a little funky, but because it's such a tight fit, this is where people are really thinking strongly about trying to find antiviral drugs. And so we talked about this briefly when we talked about the entry process, where you can find a small molecule that fits exactly into the canyon. And it turns out that that canyon has to be un is part of undergoing this big conformational change. So it's an interesting site in terms of thinking about treatment. These individual <clears throat> virus protein Subunits, VP1, 2, and 3, not surprisingly, maybe hard to tell here, look pretty similar to each other. Because again, they've all got to pack together into this T equals 3 icosahedral symmetry. So here are again just the different colors, VP1, VP2, and VP3, and this canyon in between them. And that's kind of emphasized over here. Let me get this pointer back. Uh, right here, this very dark part here where you have you know, protein sticking out, and that's where you're going to end up with the interaction with the receptor. All of these proteins, all three of them, have this central beta barrel structure. And again, anti-parallel beta strands. This is different than what we saw with the completely conserved over all viruses structure, which is the double beta barrel. These beta barrels are now going to be parallel to the surface. The other beta barrels we're looking at were perpendicular to the surface. But just this idea of a beta barrel structure is incredibly well conserved and may indicate that these different viruses are still related to each other, potentially you know, way, way back in time. Um, so again, 30 of these different proteins. How does it get inside the cell? Um, here's our canyon. Now, if you just take one of these particles, this would be your big particle here, five-fold axis of symmetry. There's your VP1. Here's the canyon on the side. Here's where your receptor interacts with that. So we mentioned VP1, 2, and 3. There's also a VP4, which sits on the inside, so right underneath the five-fold axis of symmetry. After you have interactions with the receptor and this canyon, VP4 inverts and makes a hole through the membrane. And again, this should sound really, really familiar. We talked about for Phyx-174. We looked at it in the potoviruses, the T7s and T3-like uh, viruses. So very similar process. And then the genome is ejected inside the cell. Genomic RNA, different than anything we've talked about so far, 
this genomic RNA, instead of having a normal 3 prime end, actually has a protein attached to it, um, also known as VP. So VP just stands for virus protein G, um, this gray ball here. And that gets exported, and it's probably actually interactions between VPG and VP4, which helps bring it inside the cell. So what are these receptors? Um, poliovirus receptor, of course, it didn't evolve to be a receptor for poliovirus. It mostly seems to be involved in cell cell, excuse me, cell cell contact. And again, these are enteroviruses. So this, their original interaction is going to be with epithelial cells in the gut tract. And that's how the poliovirus actually gets in. Uh, has a immunoglobulin superfamily folds. So again, immunoglobulins have these particular structures that are really good at binding things. So it's not surprising that viruses have evolved to bind to these kinds of proteins. And then of the other picoRNA viruses, many of them are very similar. Again, immunoglobulin families. Integrins, these are proteins that are involved in taking up substrates from the outside. So again, not at all surprising that these receptors are also general binding proteins in the outside. So what does the genome look like when it comes inside the cell? And this is, again, very new and different, and we'll talk a bit more about it. The 5' prime end has this VPG covalently attached to it. Not surprisingly, it's got an OH, which is what the polymerase, the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, will be extending. The 3' prime end has a poly A tail. And so this poly A tail structure is very similar to poly A tails that you would see in cellular messenger RNAs. However, there is a big difference, and that is, again, all of this stuff is being made in the cytoplasm. So this poly A tail is all being added by the viral RNA dependent RNA polymerase. So poly A tail, <clears throat> 5 prime protein. This should immediately suggest a problem. What would that problem be? Forgot my list. I will print a new one out. Don't worry. And then I can throw my virion around again. So what's the problem if you get a protein bound to your 5 prime end? What do you need to do to this RNA? It's just an RNA that's come inside the cell. It needs to be translated. How does the translation machinery usually interact with messenger RNAs? 5 prime end and 5 prime, what we had in all those you know, plant viruses, cucumber mosaic virus, cap. So it has to be some kind of cap independent way of getting translation to happen. We'll talk a little bit more about that. It's also known as the internal ribosome entry site, um, or iris. So non-coding region. And then another kind of surprise, when these um, genomes were originally sequenced, and those of you who listened to TWIV, um, this was Vincent Racaniello's PhD work, uh, was determining the sequence of this particular virus, <clears throat> polio, in fact. Uh, they found out one open reading frame, which was really kind of bizarre. It's like you would expect to be multiple different open reading frames, right? Um, why would you expect to be multiple different open reading frames? What do we have when we talked about the small RNA phage? What do we have? Monday morning, I know. Pardon? Those had four open reading frames, but what, so we also just in a big picture kind of thing. What kinds of genes have we talked about before? We've talked about late genes, early genes, et cetera. Why, why are those, that's also been important, the early, early, middle, late ones? Diana? Yeah, so you can control relative concentration of proteins. And you need a lot more of what kinds of proteins? Right, your structural proteins and a lot less of your non-structural proteins. So it's kind of funky that you're making the same amount of all of these proteins. In fact, it seems to be rather inefficient. But it's biology. It works. <laughs> uh, so <clears throat> they are actually literally made as one big protein, um, starting with a short leader protein, then all of the structural proteins, 
followed by all of the non-structural proteins. Um, VP, you know, 4, 3, <clears throat> 4, 2, 3, 1. I can't remember the order, so I don't expect you guys to either. Uh, which are made as a one protein, this P1 protein, then another set of proteins which are made as a P2 protein, and another which are made as a P3 protein. And then these get chopped into smaller pieces as we go. So we'll, we'll look at that in a little bit more detail first. But first, I want to deal with this problem here that we have at the phi prime end. So normally, cellular translation, you have a cap. You have the eukaryotic initiation factors, EF4E and EIF4G, which bind to the cap and help to get the small subunit of the ribosome with eukaryotic um, initiation factor 2 with your initiator tRNA. Everything cruises along the messenger RNA until you get to the AU ATG, which is the AUG, excuse me, this is RNA. Um, and then you have hydrolysis of GTP. You get your initiator tRNA, you get two subunits of the ribosome together, and you get translation. So great, easy, wonderful. But if you don't have a cap structure, how do you deal with this? Somehow you've got to get the ribosome to this AUG. Well, this is the process called an internal ribosome entry site, or iris. Irises are structures that form in RNAs, and it turns out there are also some in cellular RNAs, but mostly present in viral RNAs. And these are structures that allow the small subunit of the ribosome and some of the initial translation factors, particularly initiation factor 2, to associate with this part of the RNA in a cap-independent fashion. And one of the really great things about this from the picoRNA virus's point of view is that since this is cap-independent, the viral protease can actually chop up some of the cellular translation proteins and then protease, anytime we see these scissors, that's a protease. <clears throat> it can degrade some of these cellular translation initiation proteins. It means that you only get translation of messenger RNAs that have irises in them. And so this is a great way for the virus to regulate translation and say, we're only going to translate this viral polyprotein. We're not going to translate the vast majority of cellular genes. So <clears throat> This is that process. If we zoom in a little bit and look at these irises, a couple of important aspects about them. We're not going to get into all of these details here. <clears throat> the first one is that there's a pyrimidine-rich sequence, and we'll talk about that a little bit later on, and then um, other secondary structures. And the fact here that this is a type 1 iris is a reminder that there are lots of other kinds of irises as well. So internal ribosome entry sites. And really what they're doing is they're getting the small subunit of the ribosome together with the initiation factor 2 and the initiator tRNA to an AUG. And that's almost always in this structure here. And in some cases, there's a short open reading frame that's made before you get to the polyprotein. In many cases, there's no extra AUG, and you form this um, polyprotein. But <clears throat> the important things here, we have a very strong secondary structure, and this pyrimidine-rich sequence, which often means you've got lots of <clears throat> Cs, and you know, poly C binding protein is something we'll see um, again a little bit later on here. But it's just bringing in, bringing all of the, the ribosome to the start site for your polyprotein. So make your polyprotein. Um, here's a, this is the RNA that comes inside the cell. Again, it's got a BPG at the five prime end poly A tail over here. First things that happens, you make this one big protein. That then gets cut into three smaller proteins, um, P1, P2, and P3. This is by one viral protease. This is the case for polio. But the main protease here is this 3C protease. Now, where do these numbers come from? The numbers come from your you know, protein 1, protein 2, and protein 3. Protein 1 is your structural protein. So, BP1, BP3, and confusingly, BP0, which will eventually also get cut here. We'll talk about that when we talk about assembly a little bit later on. 
But as far as the non-structural proteins are concerned, you've got the P2 non-structural proteins and the P3 non-structural proteins. We're not too concerned about these proteins. They're fascinating and interesting, and we could talk a long time about them. But as far as we're concerned, the important ones are really here in the three proteins. So the 3C protein is the main protease which chops everything else up. And the 3D protein is the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. So 3C and 3D are what's going to chop up the genome and, sorry, chop up the polyprotein and make more of the genome. And 3A and 3B here, 3B is also known as BPG. That's what's going to end up over here on the end of the genome. <clears throat> what is a little weird about all of these proteins? So this, yeah, this, all these are viral proteases. Viral proteases, what are they doing? They're chopping up the viral genome. But are there any proteases inside the cell when that genome comes in? In these viral proteases? There shouldn't be. And so what this means is that these viral proteases have to be able to chop themselves out of a polyprotein. So they're actually active as, you could also kind of decide and think of these as domains of this giant polyprotein. They're active and can have their activity first on themselves as part of the polyprotein, and then on other parts of the polyprotein as well. I think it's really kind of amazing that you, know, you can translate a protein which then will chop itself out of that protein. Um, still kind of amazing process and how that can actually work. So yes, they are active in the polyprotein, then we'll start to chop the other pieces out of that. A question is a stretch in the back there. Hand wave, okay. <laughs> More questions on this? When I say that, what do I mean? Time to get your clickers out. This one hopefully will be very straightforward. At least that's my plan. Oops, get this over here. Yeah. So, <clears throat> processing of picoRNA virus polyproteins to do the activity of RNA dependent RNA polymerases, RNA dependent DNA polymerases, DNA dependent RNA polymerases, proteases, or RNases. And I have most of your clickers. I think it's like one or two more people who haven't gotten clicker numbers from. I will send you some more emails and bother you about that. So. <clears throat> Five, four, three, two, one. Stop. What do we think? Yay, 95%. So one person thinks RNA dependent RNA polymerase. So processing, processing of the polyproteins. This is all about proteases. So um, proteases are going to be chewing up the polyprotein even while they are in the polyprotein. They have activity so they can cut themselves out of the polyprotein. Okay, so that's the <clears throat> protein. What about the genome? How are these genomes being made? The genome itself, again, first thing that happens, we have interactions of the ribosome with the structures at the 3' end, the iris. One of those is a poly C binding protein. Remember that um, pyrimidine rich part of the iris? That's also going to be a binding site for these are now, excuse me, cellular proteins. So these cellular proteins will interact with these things at the three prime end, or say five prime end of the genome. Also then viral proteins, the three CD protein, will interact here at the five prime end of the genome. <clears throat> Another thing that we've just seen when you have replication of any of these picoRNA virus genomes is very large number of vesicles that form 
inside the cell. And some of the viral proteins, again, we're not going to get into these, actually block vesicle transport, normal, regular vesicle transport inside the cell. And so these vesicles build up. And these vesicles seem to be important for a couple of different things. Um, the main one is really apparently concentrating the viral genomes and some of these viral proteins next to these vesicles. So if the virus and viral genomes are floating around inside the cell, they're not really at a very high concentration. If you bring them next to a vesicle, everything's going to be much higher concentration, and so you can have the activity of the viral proteins um, together with the viral genomes. So you have this vesicle formation, and these <clears throat> vesicles then bind to some of the polyproteins, particularly 3AB. 3AB has a nice hydrophobic segment that's associated with it, and that's the 3A protein, and the 3B protein, as we all remember, is the VPG protein. So VPG, again, has a OH on it, our favorite OH on the sides of proteins that get extended, of course, is a tyrosine. And that tyrosine has two uracil residues that get added to it. And if you look at the very end, the five prime end of the, the genome of all of these picoRNA viruses, they start with two U residues. Why do you think you just start with U residues? Because they bind to A's. And A's are your poly A tail, right? So the three prime end is the poly tail. So this also tells you that the negative strand is also going to be having a VPG at the five prime end of it. Now there's just two U's here. That will then get extended as a negative strand all the way out through the opposite end of the genome. Now you have two A's here, pairing with the two U's that you had at the beginning. And then VPG with two U's, which can extend its way back down the other end of the genome. Turns out that this process, the positive strand, you end up with multiple copies of these, probably partly because you have more of the polymerase associated with the five prime end here, and you get multiple extensions of the negative strand, many copies of your positive strand, many more than you have your negative strand. These are the guys which are going to get packaged into your genome a little bit later on. So the next question you may be asking yourself, which I'm sure you're all asking yourselves, is how the heck does VPG get these two U's attached to it? Turns out that in the middle of all of these genomes is something called a, <clears throat> excuse me, CRE element. This is the template that is originally used by the 3D polymerase to add to use before it goes over to the three prime end of the genome. So chop everything up, two U's get made here, those two U's bind to the poly A tail, that then gets extended through the rest of the genome. That will give you a negative strand, your positive strand, is made also with VPG with two U's, which extends its way back through the rest of the genome. All of this is done by the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, also known as 3D. And now everybody knows exactly what this structure looks like, because we've talked about it far too often before. This is a RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, but if you look at the three-dimensional structure, what does it look like? a DNA polymerase, because it's got fingers, thumb, palm, et cetera. And this is not surprising. DNA polymerases, um, DNA polymerases need templates. What else do they always need? Primers. What's the primer in this case? The primer is VPG, so the OH on the tyrosine is the primer which is being used. So people also call this a protein-primed polymerase. And we'll see protein-primed polymerases again later on in the course when we talk about some of the other viruses. So protein-primed polymerization is very common in virus genomes. And it's great because 
unlike the case for cellular primers, which you usually have to get rid of, here, you don't need to get rid of it because it's actually you know, part of what you have. But then you have the problem if you have protein primed RNA replication, how do you get translation to happen? And so you have to evolve an iris in order to have translation that's not dependent on the cap structure anymore. So protein primed, <coughs> excuse me, replication of your genome. Um, and th that then needs to get packaged into the structural proteins. That happens from these structural proteins. Again, they're made from the P1 protein, VP0, VP3, and VP1. These get cut into three pieces, which then form trimers, which will form pentamers. And the pentamers fitting together are eventually going to make your structure. I actually get kids to make poliovirus genomes when I do outreach. Um, some great plastic structures here, uh, no, plastic uh, paper structures, um, which you can cut out and then fold into um, your three-dimensional structure. Anyone's interested, I can send you some copies of these as well. But <clears throat> these pentamers now have VP0, VP3, and VP1. This then gets packaged on top of the RNA, and this is the process a lot like what Nacho hopefully showed you, where he had his red yarn, which is supposed to be the RNA, binding to the pentamers of the capsid proteins, and that all got formed together. What he didn't show you is after you have formation of these capsid structures, then there's one more step of proteolysis, and that's where you end up with VP2 and VP4. So VP0 gets cleaved at the very, very end of this process. Now, this is, proteolysis is great for all kinds of different things, but particularly in this case, this is what provides your metastability. So when you're assembling, you're just going to assemble here, and the assembly process with VP0, you only get assembly. You're not going to get any kind of disassembly. You're not going to have that conformational change that happens with VP4, you know, making holes in membrane. The only time that you could actually have an infectious particle is after all of these steps have taken place. And proteolysis is also a pretty much irreversible reaction. There's no such thing as an irreversible reaction, I know. But um, entropically, if you've got peptide bonds that have formed and those have been broken, it's really hard to make peptide bonds again. And so this proteolysis really gives a unidirectionality to assembly. Um, and that's very important, again, from the virus's point of view, because you don't want to be assembling, disassembling, assembling, disassembling. That kind of makes sense? Yes, seeing some nodding heads here. So <clears throat> proteolysis is, is very important from that process. I already mentioned what happens with the host cell translation, the Viral proteases chop up not only the virus, they also chop up EIF4G. EIF4G is critical for getting cap-dependent translation. And so if you look at what proteins are being made, this is a <clears throat> SDS page gel where people use radioactivity. So you include radioactivity, all of the proteins that are being made before you have an infection, and then one hour after infection, three hours after infection, five hours after infection, seven hours after infection. What hopefully you can see here is there are only bands now which are viral protein bands. And that's because translation of non-viral proteins, or I should say cap-dependent translation, has been pretty much turned off because EAF4G has got chopped up. So no more cap dependent. The only kind of translation you're going to get is going to be an iris dependence. Turns out that the 3C protease also will chop up parts of the cellular RNA polymerase. And this is the DNA dependent RNA polymerase. So not only is all the translation happening on viral RNAs, there aren't any more RNAs that could be getting translated. And then as I also mentioned, there's a block to vesicle transportation. So the cells build up all of these vesicles inside the cells. These are really sick cells. 
because um, they're you know, not translating, they're not transcribing, and they're getting filled up with vesicles. Um, so it's definitely a, not a very <clears throat> positive thing to have happen um, to be infected by one of these picoRNA viruses. There are other defense mechanisms that we won't get into, but if you're interested, read the end of the textbook, or I can send you some more references on how cells deal with this kind of aspect. So polio, um, <clears throat> excuse me, been very well studied. Again, we now know how it gets put together, polyprotein chopped apart, genome being made, et cetera. <clears throat> polio is a very simple virus. And one of the things that was done you know, a number of years ago now, um, 1991, I could do the uh, math, but I <clears throat> don't want to get it too much into this. But what was shown was that all you needed to do was get the RNA with a VPG attached to it inside a cell, and that cell would then make more virus. So this was actually really kind of the first case. So we had the FIX-174, we had a synthetic genome, you could put that inside a cell, it would make more of the <clears throat> virus. Here, polio virus, um, getting it made inside the cell was um, not completely straightforward. And then, a few years later, actually in this case, 11 years later, um, same group was able to take synthetic DNA, which they've been able to order online, and then put it into a cell, get that cell to transcribe and translate that RNA, and make polio virus. Now, this was a huge deal at the time. Um, people got all excited about bioterrorism and that you could buy these synthetic DNAs. And in fact, it was just about this time um, in the early 2000s, excuse me, go back, uh, that <clears throat> people started to be concerned about bioterrorism. Um, 2001, of course, is one year after, uh, one year before this, so 9-11. And this is when a lot of the manufacturers of DNA synthesizers started to put a bunch of software in their program saying, um, if anyone orders a DNA that looks like this, um, start to flash lots of red lights. Um, so this was sort of really the beginnings of thinking about some of these processes. That being said, this lab, um, so I don't know how long they were working on this project before they managed to get a active RNA inside the cell, and then it took them 11 years to get to the point that they could use synthetic DNA to do this. So it takes a rather long time and a pretty specialized lab to actually be able to do this. Um, now, why do people care so much about polio? Um, mostly because, at least before we had a vaccine, it was a really nasty disease, but actually not that nasty. And that's part of the problem with getting rid of polio that we'll talk about in the next couple of minutes here. So usually, a polio infection, nobody notices. It goes straight through. As I mentioned before, these are enteroviruses, they mostly are going to rep uh, replicate in the gut tract, go through the gut tract, end up where things in the gut tract otherwise would end up, um, and nothing really major in terms of disease, maybe a little sloughing of some of the gut um, endothelial cells. Unfortunately, in some cases, and 1 in 200 is really a guess, because if it's a non-symptomatic disease, how do you know that somebody actually has it? One in 200 cases, the virus gets out of the endothelial cells and gets into the nervous system and then can cause paralysis. And so this is the big problem with polio. It was actually extremely widespread, um, really throughout the world, and then we're slowly getting better at it. But uh, many children, particularly those under five, had then paralysis, the classic paralysis is of the lower limbs, um, which can be permanent, but much more problematic is that the neuromuscular junctions didn't work properly and people couldn't breathe. And so that is why you have these iron lungs, um, which is, oh, pardon me, um, a basically artificial breathing apparatus. Um, which helped people who had these <clears throat> acute muscle paralysis, basically allowed them to breathe. And most of the people who died here 
um, was because there were these problems with not being able to breathe properly. And in fact, the presence of these iron lungs um, really made a difference. What I didn't realize, actually, until I was studying for this lecture, is it turns out that most people actually recovered pretty quickly from these, and so they didn't have to stay in iron lungs for their whole life. Some people did, and in fact, I think the last, I think there's still one person who's um, using an iron lung somewhere in Texas uh, to actually be able to breathe. Uh, but <clears throat> this was the process, and again, fortunately, most of these, these kids uh, recovered. We'll talk about the, the Sabin strain here a little bit later on. I, this is a little bit out of order. So <clears throat> how bad was it? Um, there used to be 35,000 plus um, cases of this paralytic disease. So not just you know, the one in 200. So multiply this by 200, and that was probably the number of cases, if not many more, um, that we had in the US before vaccines came along, which was in the mid-1950s. A um, couple of things that made vaccines possible. Um, one of them was cell culture. And so literally being able to grow mammalian cells that could replicate the virus outside of the body. And a lot of that was literally developed in the early 1950s. And so the idea that you could actually have cell culture, and a lot of this um, was also HeLa cells. So Henrietta Locks, you've all heard about Henrietta Locks, the person whose cells were stolen um, by Johns Hopkins, a you know, whole different story. Great book um, on uh, Henrietta Locks. What's, this, what's the title of it again? I can't remember. The Immortal Story, right? The Immortal, immortal Story, Immortal History. Or immortal Life of, yes, Immortal Life of um, Henrietta Locks, um, written by a Portland author, in fact. Um, so highly recommend the book. Uh, but part of that was then to be able to make polio vaccine, and not so much polio vaccine, but just make a whole bunch of polio virus, and then inactivate that virus, and that could be used as a vaccine. And that was the Salk vaccine, um, inactivated polio virus, um, also known as IPV, and we'll talk more about IPV a little bit later on. Um, just because of IPV, there was a 90% reduction um, Two years later, which is insane, you know, two years after the vaccine is introduced, um, you have 90% reduction of the incidence of disease in the US, and basically um, gone by 1979. There's some cases that still came up after that, but we'll, we'll get back to that. Um, that was a sort of a classic kind of vaccine, uh, make a lot of the virus, kill it off, um, inactivate it in some way, and then use that to generate an immune response. And that's an injected, again, inactivated or injected polio vaccine. This is the, the polio shot. And you know, polio shot, well, no one has polio shots anymore. Actually, we now do back in the US. But mostly when you see polio vaccination, it's called the oral polio vaccine. And that's an attenuated form of the virus. And we haven't talked about attenuation yet, have we? OK, so the whole idea of attenuation is you have a pathogenic virus, or for that matter, pathogenic bacterium. And you grow that virus in, originally it was actually in a organism. This was done originally by Louis Pasteur, um, who did this for rabies virus. But also happens in cell culture, where you take the virus out of that round of cell culture and put it back into an organism or cell culture, take that virus out and put it back in. And what happens over what are called these multiple passages, where you take virus out, reinfect, take it out, reinfect, take it out, reinfect, is you're basically evolving for a virus which is less, less pathogenic. Because, you know, again, we, we talked about this right very, very much at the beginning. You know, if you're killing off your host all the time, it's not really to your advantage as a virus. So the less damage you do to your host, the better off you're going to be as a virus. And so it's really an artificial evolution experiment where you do multiple rounds of evolution and at the end come up with something which is not pathogenic but still immunogenic. Because that's the whole idea of attenuation. So Attenuated viruses, that was developed by Sabin in the 1960s. And this was a lot easier to administer because 
You could take it the way that the virus was normally infecting, i.e. through the GI tract, as opposed to an injection. And you could also use much, much lower doses because it actually made more of itself. And another thing which was really, really nice about this is that this oral polio vaccine actually then ended up where your GI tract usually ends up. And the major process of infection by wild-type polio is fecal-oral transmission, so contaminated water. Well, if you're in an area where you have contaminated water and you have this oral polio vaccine, you don't even have to vaccinate everyone if they're in a region where there's problems that there would be with standard polio transmission, then the polio vaccine actually is going to spread. So you don't have to vaccinate everybody. They will end up vaccinating their brothers and sisters or whoever else is in that particular environment. So really wonderful um, process, although has one slight drawback um, that we'll get back to in, in just a second here. Um, and um, what we then later found out, I'm sorry I'm backing up here, is that the reason that this is no longer a problem disease-wise is there's a change in the iris. And that change in the iris means that it doesn't replicate in neurons um, because there's something different about translation in neurons uh, that means a difference in terms of how this virus is replicated. So it replicates just fine in the gut, but doesn't seem to get into neurons. So, what does happen when you get in neurons, um, as I mentioned, they'll show this iron lungs before, but much more common are these lower extremities. And so this is a really classic example of this paralysis which happens. It's been known for literally thousands of years. Um, this is from 1400 BC. Um, also, you had people who apparently had um, polio-like disease, at the very least, um, literally thousands of years ago. So because of the iron lung effect, people were dying, etc. cetera. Um, these vaccines were introduced, and they've really been incredibly successful. Mid 20th century, well, half a million deaths a year. 1988, um, there was a, the start to the eradication program, still about 350,000. 2015, 74 cases. This is, that, that's crazy. That's absolutely amazing. Um, unfortunately, this is, um, that's a, the last couple of years hasn't gotten that much better. Um, so 22 cases in 2017, 33 in 2018, and nine as of last week when I went and checked out um, npoliounow.org. Um, this has cost over $4 billion um, in the US in the process so far, likely to cost more um, as we move along. Now, why, why have we haven't gotten this to completely zero? Um, this is actually from last year, but um, the places where polio is still endemic are Nigeria, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and then in 2018, there was also this um, outbreak um, right here in Western Syria. Um, but what are the problems that particularly these two countries have? Yeah, besides war, war is the major issue, is that it's really hard to vaccinate when it's right in the middle of a war. And really, unfortunately, uh, a lot of the people here, pardon me, uh, are suspicious of vaccinators. Um, and as far as I'm concerned, the real heroes in this process are the people, particularly in, in Pakistan, but probably in Afghanistan as well, um, who are the vaccinators, who go out to the villages and really try and get vaccination to take place here. Um, we'll talk about that a little bit more in, in just a second here. Um, Nigeria, um, particularly northern Nigeria, um, Boko Haram is also really undergoing war and makes it really hard to get vaccination taking place here. Um, here in <clears throat> excuse me, western Syria um, is right where Raqqa is, and this is what the conditions looked like there um, as of last year. Um, there was a pretty big outbreak. Uh, I think it was 80 or 90 cases of the um, polio-derived disease. Um, and you know, again, these are the people who are the real heroes who are going out in these places and, and really trying to vaccinate the kids. Um, unfortunately, um, this is from the Telegraph of 26th, so earlier this week. 
um, a third polio um, vaccinator in Pakistan was shot. So um, these are really amazing things that people are doing. Again, um, kudos to all of them who are going out and trying to really eliminate um, this kind of disease. But one of the things that was interesting is in Syria, you may have noticed uh, here, it's not endemic. It doesn't, it's not yellow. So these dots, the green dots on here, these are something which is a bit of an issue, also present here in the Congo. Something called VDPV. What the heck is VDPV? Vaccine-derived polio disease. So what the heck is vaccine-derived polio disease? So if you remember that Sabin vaccine, which is great and wonderful, you know, goes through the gut tract, it can spread, um, really easy to administer, a couple of drops, you don't need to inject anything. That's great and wonderful, but it only has a couple of mutations in the iris. What happens when viruses replicate? Particularly if they've got RDRPs that are not terribly high fidelity. Mutations happen. And what happens is some of those will revert and revert that mutation. And so you end up with now an actually infectious and disease-causing virus. And infectious, they all are because of the oral polio vaccine. But now it can cause disease. And in fact, that's why in the US, you don't actually have oral polio vaccine anymore. All kids get the injected vaccine because there is a very low risk, you know, literally one in about 200 million, um, of reversion happening. And because there is otherwise no disease in the US, and we have enough of a medical system where we can get injected vaccine, then injected vaccine is happening. So, and this is, you know, of 10 billion doses, you know, 580 cases. So it's really, really rare. But if you're trying to get close to completely eliminating it, and you've got all of this, you know, circulating vaccine, it can actually really be a problem. So those 74 cases of all of them um, in Syria were due to this reversion that had happened of these attenuated viruses. So attenuation is great because it replicates, you use smaller amounts, normal infection routine, but at the same time, you have this danger of a, of a possible reversion. Um, there were 34 cases um, in 2018 of this um, vaccine-derived polio, and if we go back to here, so 33 cases of wild polio. So this means that you know, this wonderful vaccine is great and wonderful, but we may need to start changing our processes in a little bit here if we really want to eliminate polio. So what are we going to do? Um, we need to get rid of this oral polio vaccine, which again, works wonderfully, really easy to administer. Now you have to have a smiling baby when it gets shot. Yeah, Mika, sorry. And then just like, John, yeah. Oh, so the, the whole polioeradication.org? Yeah. Um, so this is a whole combination. So the, the team is the WHO Rotary, um, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. I have to forget, we can go, go and check out the website at, at some point as well. Um, and they're all coordinating with the local governments, particularly the governments in Afghanistan and Pakistan and Nigeria which is, of course, easier said than done, particularly in Afghanistan, um, to try and organize these um, vaccination campaigns. And then when there is an outbreak of vaccine-derived polio, then you want to go back in and really try to control those outbreaks as rapidly as possible. And so there are rapid response teams as well that end up you know, going into places like Raqqa and trying to, to deal with um, these kinds of situations. Yeah, John? So great question is how do you know whether it's vaccine derived or not? So it's the there is not just a change that happens in the iris. There are other changes in the genome. And so literally what you do is you sequence the genomes of these things. 
Um, and then you can see whether it's the wild type or if it's the vaccine derived strain. Yeah, Diana. Ah, <laughs> the oral injection both provide the same storage. So um, oral needs to be kept cold. Um, the depending on the formulation of your injected polio vaccine, um, it needs to be kept cold or not. Um, just depends on exactly how it's being made. So yes, we've got some work to do. <laughs> okay, so um, 100% on the next quicker question, hopefully. Let's see if we can do this. In the next few decades, the most likely source of poliomyelitis is, oh, here we are, start, wild virus vaccine derived, Nigeria, India, Israel. No, it's not measles I'm talking about here. Five, click now or forever hold your peace. Vaccine derived polio, that's why we need to switch from OPV to IPV. Um, and definitely the numbers of wild polio are going down and down, whereas the vaccine derived are staying about the same. So, and literally in the next decades, next couple of years, there may still be some more wild, but the uh, other ones <clears throat> are likely to be um, vaccine derived. So that's why we need to get rid of it. Um, I could spend two minutes just reviewing things, or we could just say um, we'll meet again on Wednesday. Does that work? Or do you want to just review stuff really quickly, Janan? Review real quickly. Okay, so um, close that up. <clears throat> so PicoRNA viruses, um, there are lots of them. Um, probably been around for a long time. Even polio has. They're still here. We haven't gotten rid of them yet. Um, the <clears throat> There's pseudo T equals three because we've got three different proteins in the final structure in the capsid. Um, starts out as VP0, VP1, and VP3. Then that gets cleaved at the very end. These irises, internal ribosome entry sites, that's how you get translation because you've got a VPG sticking at the end of your genome. Um, proteases chop everything up. Um, VPG is the primer for the 3D RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, which looks like a DNA polymerase, has to then extend from three prime OHs. Um, protomers, protomers here is just they've got these bigger proteins that get broken down later on. Our host effect, you're slowing down cellular translation by chopping up your translational initiation proteins. You're blocking the RNA polymerase. And then disease, which is you know, rare, but so prevalent that we're still having um, cases that are happening. And that actually reminds me again, that part of the problem with the vaccine-derived disease is that there's lots of this vaccine strain which is circulating all the time because it's replicative. And so um, the wild cases are just going to be the few cases where you have the wild disease. But again, that can spread really easily through you know, fecal-oral. And also the other thing about war is... Um, General hygiene is also a lot harder under those kinds of conditions. So you have a lot more um, problems with water sources, et cetera. Okay. So now we're happy with our picoRNA viruses, right? And know how to deal with our colds as well. <clears throat> 